still waiting for some seconds or something. Yeah, it's 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 not it's not allowing me to to go live. It says um, it's webinar streaming live on Facebook. That's not it's, accurate. Are we live? I don't know what we're working with, comrade. I don't know what's going on. Oh, Chairman, we ready. Uhuru. Uhuru means freedom. It is Swahili. It is a word uh, that was made popular, a slogan demand, that was made popular under cir circumstances quite similar to what we see happening today in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was the Kenyan Land Freedom Army called the Mau Mau that in the 1950s had grown so tired of being dominated by a foreign and alien power in East Africa, in Kenya, by British white colonial interlopers. So I greet you with that word Uhuru. I say Uhuru because it means freedom and it reminds us who we are as a people, as African people. And we say Uhuru because we think freedom is something that has to be on the minds of African people 24 hours a day. So I want to talk to you as the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party the chairman of the organization that has provided African people in this country and around the world for the first time in our history, our own revolutionary political party that is absolutely necessary for the African working class to possess if we're going to win our freedom, if we're going to be able to have an appropriate analysis that would help us to understand what is happening in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and throughout this country and throughout the world, how it's connected to what's happening around the world. So what we are looking at in, in Minneapolis is the existential crisis of a system that came into existence through the genocide of the indigenous people who are called Indians the indigenous people of this land and the captivity and colonial enslavement of African people. This, this system, this crisis of the system is something that is being pushed into full view of all the peoples of the world by the crescendo of resistance that characterizes our struggle in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the USA. It's important to say that that the system itself, what we're looking at, is not simply a crisis in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but the entire social system, especially as it is rooted in the United States, but globally, is experiencing existential crisis. The murder of George Floyd, Floyd a 46-year-old African man, in a typically brutal and wanton act of colonial terror, inflamed the righteous indignation of our long suffering people leading to masses of Africans breaking free of the political and ideological, ideological constraints imposed on our struggle since the military defeat of the black revolution of the 1960s and our fight for happiness and the return of our stolen resources. In just a few days, the struggles that we have seen unleashed in Minneapolis this unbridled resistance of African people has forced creatures 
like Joe Biden, who is the presumptive Democratic presidential candidate, he's the one responsible for authoring a colonial crime bill in the US Congress that won white support for the presidential campaign of William Jefferson Clinton by putting 100,000 police in our colonized and starving communities, he has been forced to declare his sympathy for Africans suffering police violence. Other politicians, including heads of police organizations have officially declared disgust with the videographed murder of George Floyd. Religious leaders, artists, sports figures have all been in a frantic race to state their opposition to the cruel treatment of African colonial subjects by the police in the United States. These declarations of spontaneous black love and the inconsequential declaration that black lives matter includes the mayor of Indianapolis. What the black reformists, preachers, pacifists, and generally traitorous politicians have not been able to accomplish since the US government elevated them to positions of presumed leadership after the defeat of the black revolution of the 1960s resulted in the murders of Malcolm X and the pacifist Dr. Martin Luther King and scores of revolutionary leaders and the hundreds of thousands of Africans who have occupied prison cells since that time. The preachers, the sellouts, the politicians have been not able to force any of these forces to come out expressing any unity or solidarity or sympathy or empathy with the conditions of African people since that time. That's been more than two generations. They've been stuffing prison cells with African people. They've been starving our communities. They've used economic terror against us, of pushing us out of our communities and the rest of it all that time. In just a few days, the, mini the militants in Minneapolis have, has accomplished more uh, than these sellouts have over this long period of time. And this incredible mass seizure of the third precinct police station abandoned by escaping colonial military forces known in the US as the police has raised the resistance to a level almost unheard of in the US and certainly not heard of since the African petty bourgeois neo-colonial opportunists walked over the graves of murdered and imprisoned freedom fighters to take up their rewards as spokespersons for our oppressed people. While these opportunists have been forced to voice sympathy to the cause of our people, they are the ones who are mostly voicing opposition to the so-called excesses of the growing resistance that has led to the destruction of the third precinct military outposts and the corporate businesses that fell to the wrath of the people. It is they, the opportunists, who equate the destruction of some small African businesses by the people with the destruction of Target and other billion dollar colonial capitalist enterprises that function as the existential threat to all small businesses in Minneapolis and the colonized communities globally. So while we have these pacifists and opportunists and liberals who want to make the fundamental question or a fundamental question, the fact that some small businesses in our community were destroyed, they ignore the fact that all of the businesses in our community uh, uh, threaten their existence, uh, threatened, their existence have been threatened by these major corporations like Target, uh, Walmart, uh, you name them, they are the ones who have been killing the small businesses in our community all this time. Colonialism has been doing that and not African workers who are struggling against our oppression. Our party must provide the political education to the people that would allow the resistance to have greater clarity about who it attacks. And we must recruit more of the small businesses to actively join in the struggle against colonialism so that their small enterprises will become anti-colonial enterprises that recognizes themselves as functioning in our communities to negate 
the influence of billion dollar corporations that exist as capitalist extractors in our already destitute communities. The Minneapolis uprising is functioning as the spark igniting the metaphorical prairie fire in Los Angeles, Louisville, Denver, New York, Chicago, Oakland, Huntsville, Alabama, St. Pete, Florida, St. Louis, Portland, DC, Philadelphia, Newark, and other places, what we are seeing uh, is that these uprisings and demonstrations are becoming the order of the day. The naked, nasty underbelly of US imperialism is being revealed again to the world. Our colonized people have been criminalized by imperialist white power since the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s. When our revolution was alive and strong, the world was able to empathize and unite with our aspirations for liberation because it was clear to the world that the US, in the US, we were, our, our churches were being bombed and our children were being killed and our leaders were being assassinated just because we wanted to experience some modicum of democracy. The African opportunists of the Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton ilk, among those who assisted the US in giving the impression that somehow African colonial subjects had become Americans and that our fundamental aspirations had been achieved, which was in their view, acceptance as US citizens. The mass uprisings of Minneapolis and other places function as much to break free of that false narrative and political assumption as they do to fight against police brutality. The uprisings are exposing to the world. The uprisings are exposing to the world that Africans continue to suffer from colonial domination, that the US government and state are the enemy, not some, not some impoverished African like Floyd, who is held up as examples of black criminality in a democratic US. Our struggle is escalating. We saw a major development that occurred in Ferguson, St. Louis, Missouri in 2014, just six years ago. This was the thing that really reunited the militancy of Africans throughout this country, helping to uh, raise the consciousness of our people to levels that we hadn't seen since the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 1960s. And now we are in Minneapolis and various other places where the masses are breaking free and are making this struggle. Brothers and sisters and comrades, our struggle is a just struggle. And the fact is the struggle of our people in Minneapolis is a just struggle. And the destruction of that military outpost, uh, the third precinct was an was a awesome, awesome righteous uh, act by the masses of people who need to break free. What has happened to our movement over the last period of time is that the pacifists and the preachers uh, and the opportunists uh, have, have been able to uh, uh, accomplish uh, much of what uh, the US military murders of our revolutionaries was unable to do alone. They have struggled to convince Africans and the world that what African people are struggling for is not any material gains, nothing that satisfies the material interests of our people, nothing that is about realizing uh, a capacity to end the indignations, the police murder, the mass uh, arrest of our people, uh, nothing that gives us power in our own hands, nothing that we were fighting for in the 1960s that talked about self-government that was in solidarity with all the other oppressed peoples around the world. Uh, what they have convinced Africans, many Africans in this country, and what they have convinced the peoples of the world is that African people are fighting against this, this thing that they call racism. And if you're fighting against racism, the way they have, uh, have defined it, is what you're fighting for is to make white people or the colonizer like us. It's like we don't have any material interest 
everything is subjective and based on winning the approval and appreciation of the very same colonial force, the very same uh, white people, white power that oppresses us. This is what they have been able to do over long periods of time. Now, as we see this, this a crescendo of actions, of uprisings, of mobilizations by African people fighting against this oppression, we see uh, an awakening, a political awakening happening among the masses of our people. Your party, the African People's Socialist Party, the organization that for the first time provides the African working class with its own instrument for liberation, with its own ability to fight and win our freedom, uh, has brought to us the science of revolution, has brought to us an understanding that we cannot achieve anything fighting against the ideas in the heads of white people or anybody else, that our struggle has to be one for total liberation of black people. And that increasingly is what we are going to be able to see happening in Minneapolis, happening in Los Angeles, happening in all these other places where African people are oppressed and are organizing uh, to win uh, some modicum of freedom. This is not to say that we won't wage uh, struggles for democratic rights, but in every instance when we are fighting for democracy, the African People's Socialist Party, the organization of the African working class armed with the theory of African internationalism will help us to understand that even struggles for democratic rights, for democracy, for, for, for reform, are struggles to position ourselves in a better place so that we can win the total liberation of our people. This is very important for us to understand. This is my opportunity to speak to you about what our struggle must be about and do so within the context of the uprising that's happening in Minneapolis, the thousands of African and other people who are in the streets, who are wreaking havoc for the normal functioning of a social system uh, that has only uh, the objective of world domination and the oppression and exploitation of the peoples of the world. In fact, it is through African internationalism, it is through the work and activity and teachings of the party of the African working class that we have come to understand that the entire world and economic configuration uh, has its origin in the enslavement of black people, of African people. This is where the whole social system began. This is the origin of Target. This is the organ or origin of, of the various other institutions that suck the blood and resources of African and other peoples around the world. The slavery, Karl Marx, who was a white man, who was somebody who used to be appreciated by white uh, leftists, once said uh, that uh, what he characterized as wage slavery, that is the work and capitalist activity in Europe, he said wage slavery in Europe requires as a pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world. And the new world as they were defining, it had to do with African people who have been, have been uh, uh, forcibly dispersed around the world to create wealth and value for white people and white power at the expense of wealth and value of African people ourselves. This is the kind of social system we are dealing with. When we look at what happened to uh, brother George Floyd, it is not unusual. The fact of the matter is that what we experience is colonialism. Colonialism is the absolute total domination of a people by foreign and alien power that controls everything. And the ability to eat, uh, the ability to function in society is under false uh, domination, false the domination of a, of a brutal uh, 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 alien and foreign power. That's what we are experiencing. That's what it means. That's why it is every time we look up, uh, the police are killing us. They're not just killing us uh, in Minneapolis. They're not just killing us uh, in St. Louis. They're killing us all around this country. And one of the things that's contributed to the uh, resistance, the uprising, there's several things. One, this uprising rests upon a foundation of the brilliant uprising that we saw happening in Ferguson on Canfield Drive. And then Canfield Drive, this too was an uprising that escaped the control of the African petty bourgeoisie, and, and especially as it first uh, began. It started right there in an African working class community on Canfield Drive in Ferguson. And it's the African workers. They didn't, they didn't come out saying Black Lives Matter. They didn't come out saying hands up, don't shoot. They were saying kill the police. 
And they were saying kill the police as a, as a logical response to the reality that the police are killing us throughout this country and various other places around the world. So now we have our own party, an African working class party, a vanguard party, the advanced detachment of the working class itself that functions uh, as the general staff uh, of the revolution. And this is what we are talking about today, uh, functioning as the general staff, as the advanced detachment of the uh, African working class and the oppressed uh, African nation. So it's really important uh, for us to understand that. It's really important for us to have no sympathy at all uh, for this notion that somehow destroying property on stolen indigenous land uh, that was created by uh, African oppressed and enslaved people uh, as uh, some of the opportunists right there uh, in, uh, in, in Minneapolis would have us to believe that somehow uh, that's the problem that we are the criminals. In fact, uh, many of the people who are condemning the African people and the masses who have uh, taken on target and they call us looters and things like that, some of them claim to believe in reparations, but they don't believe in reparations. What they believe in, most of them who are doing this condemnation is the US government. They believe that the US government is somehow going to give reparations to the people who then, from whom they've stolen everything uh, and that somehow they will make it right for us. What we are saying is that reparation is the expropriation of the expropriators. When the people go into that target, when the people go into uh, the various other co uh, colonial corporations that exist uh, in this country and around the world, uh, they are ex 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 expressing uh, uh, reparations in a very serious kind of way. And they haven't gone through a court and they haven't gone through a legislation to do it because the masses of the people recognize it is we who create the value and everything that you see. Uh, if it's Apple, uh, uh, if it's uh, some other major corporation, it has come at the ex as a consequence of stolen value of African people, stolen labor of African people, and as a consequence of the genocide that's been uh, inflicted upon the uh, indigenous population. <clears throat> who are living in these concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. So we're not sympathetic at all uh, to those uh, things, but we do know that the people have to be organized and that even though we appreciate uh, the militancy and we appreciate the ability of the people to take the struggle to a higher level, there must be a to what end uh, that is involved in the struggle. The people have to be conscious of goals, revolutionary goals of taking power, political power. This is one of the reasons why we are so opposed to this notion of racism, because racism doesn't, fighting against racism doesn't take you to power, doesn't change anything about your lives. It just makes you a servant to white power. It makes you someone who spends your time trying to win uh, uh, appreciation by those who colonize us uh, by trying to make everybody get along together, the colonized and the colonizer, when the fact of the matter is it's the responsibility of the colonized to destroy colonialism, to destroy the system of colonialism, because it's a blood sucking system that sucks the blood and resources of our people. All of our communities around this country and the world, in fact, are encircled by steel, by uh, armed forces who are there for the purpose of maintaining uh, this social system. That's what the police is. They are not there to help us. They don't come to our communities uh, to take help uh, people take little kittens uh, out of the trees. They are there in order to maintain this relationship that African people who are colonized have uh, with white power, with colonial capitalism. And the truth is they have to be there because colonialism cannot work. Uh, the domination of an African people cannot work without extreme violence being imposed on that people and the threat of violence. That is why in this country, while we can demonstrate quickly about a police killing such as what we see and what's, what we've just seen happening in Minneapolis, the reality is that in this country, the largest prison population in the world, more than 2 million people in prison and more than half of them African people and other colonized people. Where, how did they get to prison? They didn't volunteer to do that. The police didn't kill them, they arrested them. They made the decision of when they should go to prison and it's a colonial system that made that determination. In this country, in the, in the United States, brothers and sisters, one of the things that the African People's Socialist Party, our party, the party of the African working class, the advanced detachment of the African working class has helped to explain to people 
is that one of the things that makes colonialism difficult to understand to some degree uh, here uh, and to recognize is that what happens in the United States is what we refer to as domestic colonialism. The United States is a white settler state. It is a state where Europeans left Europe and came uh, to this territory, just like they left Europe and went to Palestine and stole uh, the land of the Palestinian people and now call themselves Israelis and name uh, the land Palestine, renamed it uh, Israel, just as white people left Europe and went to uh, Africa and uh, stole the land and called uh, the, the land South Africa and then called themselves South Africans, given the impression that they've always been there, just as the, the same thing happened in the United States where you had Europeans who left Europe and came uh, to this territory, this land, and in order to take and keep this land, in order to hold up the notion, the lie, uh, that they are, 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 are people who are indigenous to this land, uh, they have committed, they committed near genocide against the indigenous people within these borders that they have created. This land is the land of the indigenous people. This is their land. And then they captured African people and brought us here uh, to work for free for slaves. And they're claiming, they're crying to us about a target uh, that was destroyed uh, uh, in, in Minnesota. Uh, they worked us for free for slaves. The economic foundation of target is African enslavement. Uh, and it's not like some genius white people created all this wealth. It came from the slave trade. It came from colonialism. It came from European imperialist domination of Africa and the rest of the world. And that is what it, we are dealing with. The whole world economy, the configuration, the political and economic configuration of the world is based on that reality. And that's the thing that whether people are conscious of it or not, that people are actively engaged in breaking out of. That's the reason that you see the economic crisis that exists in the United States, that exists in Europe. That's the reason that you see a Brexit uh, where the, the, the so-called British are leaving the European Union uh, because the capitalism that came into existence was born uh, as a consequence of enslavement and colonized the peoples of the world. And the peoples of the world everywhere are fighting back to take back our resources. And now the white man, the, uh, the, which is, uh, 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 a statement that I make is, is symbolic of the U.S. government, the U.S. Uh, social system. Uh, now the white man finds himself uh, uh, having to fight among uh, themselves and have to kill the peoples of the world to maintain this status quo, the parasite. That is what the system is. It's a parasitic system. It came into existence through enslaving people. It came into existence through stealing people's land and resources. It can only maintain that through brutal uh, uh, oppression of the peoples of the world. It has established economic and political structures uh, to make sure that this system stays in place. Uh, and that is why you see in the world today, the US and other countries attacking peoples around the world. That's why they are trying to starve the people of Venezuela, take their resources. That's why they are threatening and initiating what they call sanctions against the people of Iran. That's why they are attacking Syria and other places around the world. That's why they are attacking the Palestinians. They want to maintain this nasty status quo. And that's why they are attacking our people in Zimbabwe and all over the continent of Africa and also in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are part of the same struggle. We are part of the same fight back and we have to understand that if we are going to be victorious. So the struggle is not against racism. The struggle is not to make white people like us or love us. And this is not an anti-white statement. It is an anti-colonial statement. The fact is that white people who want to be loved uh, need to do something to earn the love of the mass of the peoples of the world by turning against their own ruling class we shouldn't, we shouldn't have had to burn Target. They should have burned Target. They should have expropriated all the resources from Target. They should have initiated a reparations uh, drive that took all the resources uh, from Target and from the rulers of this country and turned it back over to African and African people from whom it was stolen. This is what their task is. So it's not about being against white people. And in fact, we have organized uh, a movement. We have organized uh, through the African People's Socialist Party an entity of party organization that's called the African People's Solidarity Committee and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. These are movements that recognize that white people have to earn their place back 
in the family of humanity by turning their backs on their own ruling class and by expropriating the resources that have been stolen uh, from us that's responsible for our great impoverishment. They have to be uh, fighting, they have to be uh, black power in white face in the same way that your local politician is white power in black face. So this is what, what we are talking about. So we have to recognize brothers and sisters when we look at what's happening in Minneapolis that is part and parcel of the world struggle. It is part and parcel of the struggles of the peoples of the world to rectify their relationship with imperialism and imperial white power. We have to recognize also brothers and sisters, and this is fundamental, uh, that while we are fighting uh, in, in Minneapolis and in Los Angeles and in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Pensacola, Florida, and in St. Petersburg and Huntsville, Alabama, and all these other places while we are fighting in all those other places, uh, we are a part of a struggle that has its origin in the initial attack on Africa. That's how we got here. Africans didn't come to this country looking for a better way of life. In fact, we lost a better way of life as a consequence of being brought here. We are the only group other than the indigenous people themselves that did not come to this country looking for a better way of life. We are the only group that to which that happened. People like to talk about and our, your white liberal friends and the Joe Bidens and the rest and the Bernie Sanders and the rest of them that like to talk about America is a, a nation of immigrants. Africa, first of all, America is not a nation. It's a prison of nations. And Africans are not immigrants, we are captives. And we're talking about being on the land uh, that was stolen from the indigenous people, part of whom are uh, recognized as Mexicans. You talk about a situation where half of Mexico was taken at gunpoint by the United States an artificial border created that's resulted in starvation and deprivation and oppression of the people on both sides of that artificial border in what they recognize as Mexico and what they recognize as Texas or Utah or Arizona or New Mexico and all of these other places. So that's the reality, that's the configuration that we're looking at in terms of political configuration of the world and it has its origin uh, in the enslavement and colonization of the vast majority of the people. So we are Africans. There's no way you can get around. You can't get on a boat in Africa as an African and then get off the same boat uh, in the United States as a Negro. If we were Africans when we got on the boat, brothers and sisters, we had to be Africans when we got off the boat. And what this is, is so important because if you don't understand that, then you don't understand that as the foreign and alien force that's dominating Black people, you uh, fall prey to the notion that somehow uh, we are Americans and they are Americans and they just don't give us as many rights as we should have when the reality is we are colonial subjects, just like the people of Vietnam existed under French colonialism, just like, and then American colonialism when the, Viet, when the, when the Vietnamese defeated the French, just like the people in, in various other places around the world have lived under colonial domination, just like the people in Afghanistan are occupied by colonial domination in this instance, the United States. We are a dominated colonized population and we have to fight out for our freedom against this colonial domination, which means among the other things that we have to achieve is self-government. We can't have any freedom as long as somebody else uh, is responsible or control our ability to feed, clothe, and house ourselves. Self-government has to be on our agenda. So when we out struggling, when we are making these amazing, incredibly heroic struggles uh, in, in, in Minneapolis, we need to have on our agenda, it needs to be part of what we are fighting for, self-government, self-determination, and control of our own economic capacity. And we're doing this not in isolation. There's war, struggle happening right there in Haiti. Haiti is a territory that, <coughs> that, well, that African people we owe so much uh, 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 to our brothers and sisters uh, who uh, suffered in Haiti. In Haiti, the African revolution in Haiti almost destroyed the capitalist system itself at a time when the whole capitalist system was organized around direct slavery. It's the Africans in Haiti who defeated Napoleon's best army, who once liberating Haiti, uh, told Africans any place in the world, if you're enslaved, you get to Haiti, you will be free. Uh, who made it illegal for white people to own land in Haiti because they were the colonizer. It was Haiti that did that. And then, of course, Haiti has been paying the price since then because what the imperialists have done to punish Haiti, the first Black republic that was created after slavery, what they've done to punish Haiti uh, is to continue to rob Haiti of all its resources. They've been, Haiti has been invaded uh, by the United States Marines who took all the money out of the treasury. Haiti has been uh, uh, 
uh, uh, attacked uh, by France and all of the white power, the first, uh, the first economic quarantine or sanction that happened in the Western hemisphere happened against black people in Haiti because Haiti was the beacon of hope. Haiti was that which inspired forces like Nat Turner, inspired forces like Denmark Vesey, who assumed that we could make this revolution because we were making revolution in other places around the world. Haiti was the place that inspired revolution all over the Americas. That was our Haiti, that was African people. And now they are struggling by themselves because there is not a common recognition among black people, either in Haiti or in Minneapolis that we are part of the same struggle. We are part of the same struggle. But part of the problem is that in the United States, we have colonialism uh, and it's a different kind of colonialism because we characterize it as domestic colonialism. It's different only in the sense it is a colonialism that exists on the same territory as the colonizer. Usually what we've seen is the white man leaves uh, Europe, he goes to Africa, he dominates the people there, he goes to Vietnam, he dominates and set up a colonial power there. And it's clear that this white man is the foreigner. Uh, he goes to other places around the world, but now in this country, what they've succeeded in doing and helping to convince the people, especially since our revolution was defeated in the 1960s, what they've done in this country is they said, well, everybody is an American. Now they characterize black people as an American in this country. And so they, and that they can only do that because they've stolen the land from the indigenous people they've almost committed genocide. They haven't succeeded in that. Of course, the indigenous people are fighting like hell on every front and they're doing it almost alone. Uh, but there they have disguised the fact that African people live under colonial domination with the characterization that we are all Americans. But the false, na a false national consciousness has been imposed on black people all around the world. You gotta remember that what happened was Europeans sat down at a table in Europe. This is the white man, sat down on a table in Europe uh, in 1884 in Berlin, Germany. And they, re they carved up Africa. Africa didn't have those borders. And then they say, okay, they carved it up so that they could uh, give uh, uh, certain portions of Africa to different uh, African countries so that they could become rich off our resources. And they say the French can have what they now uh, have what uh, uh, is now referred to as common room. Uh, the other people can have, uh, 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 the British can have what is now character what's called the Gold Coast. That's now called Ghana. Uh, the British can have this territory called Kenya. And all of this happened all over the continent of Africa. And then what we have uh, uh, subsequent to that is that uh, the Portuguese, it was the British who invented Nigeria. The British, the white man invented Nigeria, uh, just as he invented many other places in the, in the, middle, in the middle East. And uh, uh, Nigeria was named Nigeria in 1915 by a white woman who was uh, uh, a wife of, uh, of Frederick Lugard, uh, who created and developed the whole uh, 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 strategy of indirect rule called neocolonialism. And he was sent to Africa, to West Africa, with the responsibility by the British government of putting this territory, making it one administrative hold, and they named they gave, gave it uh, uh, from his wife, Flora Shaw, was nigger area. That's where Nigeria comes from. You have a situation where in in West Africa, off the coast of West Africa, the Portuguese, when they first got there, they found shrimp. And the Portuguese word for shrimp, it sounds like Cameroon. And so they named the place Cameroon, Cameroon. And then Africans refer to ourselves as Cameroonians, as Nigerians, as Black Americans, as Negro Americans, as Black Brits, as uh, Afro-Swedes, uh, Afro-Colombians, and all these other characterizations. We've been had a false national consciousness imposed on us so it's far hard for us to find our way. So brothers and sisters, I just wanted to say that this is a part of what it is that we have to understand, that uh, we're not fighting against racism, we're fighting against colonialism. We're fighting to have power over our own lives. We have to take that consciousness, this responsibility of the advanced attachment of revolutionaries, to take that understanding, that science, that African internationalist understanding, because a revolution must have a, a revolutionary theory. And uh, you, we have to take this revolutionary theoretical understanding uh, into the struggles of our people. When the people are engaged in struggle, we have to take this information, this understanding. That's what I'm participating in doing today. That's what we do as the African People's Socialist Party in various places around this country and around the world. The African working class has created an African Socialist International. It, is, it is, has allowed us uh, to put the struggle of African people down under the leadership of its advanced attachment, the working class, 
and throughout the various places of the world in the Caribbean, we are in the Bahamas. Uh, we are in East, we are in uh, 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 South Africa. Uh, we are in West Africa and South Africa, I'm, I'm particularly uh, pleased with the work that we do there, the organization capacity we've developed there. We are in West Africa. Uh, we uh, uh, in, in, in West Africa, in Ghana, Sierra Leone, uh, we are building bases in various other places on the continent. We are uh, throughout Europe, we are in England, we are in France. Uh, uh, so we are struggling uh, also in the United States because the fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, as quiet as it's kept, and even though Al Sharpton don't want you to know this, and even though Brennan Saunders wouldn't want you to know this, uh, the African revolution, the struggle for black power, the struggle for black freedom, has run into its limitations when fought within the context of the borders that were created for us by white power. We are one Africa, we are one nation, and our struggle has to be for the total liberation of Africa and African people around the world. We have to fight uh, for our material interests, and our material interests are all the resources of the richest continent on earth, which is Africa. Um, our material interests uh, happen to be uh, the resources that we find in the communities that we've created globally all around the world. We have to fight for power. We have to fight for self-government. We have to fight to be our own government. And we also have to fight for the interests of our people, our class. The African working class is going to have to lead this struggle for national liberation if it's going to result in overturning a system based, based on parasitic extraction of value and the genocide of peoples around the world. So I wanted to have this discussion with you, my brothers and sisters and friends. Uh, because our objective, and as, as, as the struggle uh, is unfolding uh, in Minneapolis, and uh, Minneapolis has served as a spark uh, that's uh, initiating struggles in various other places, we have to have consciousness of what it is that we're fighting for, that our movement has to be able to say, to what end are we fighting? Uh, when people look at us around the world, they have to be able to answer this question, yes, we want reparation, we want payback, we want everything. And so payback is target. Payback is expropriating the expropriators. We want all of Europeans out of Africa who uh, came there and exist there uh, as a part of extracting value from Africa. Uh, they will have to commit national suicide in order to uh, stay uh, in Africa. That means they're going to have to unite with the aspirations of the African working class and turn over to African working class all the value that they've extracted that allowed them to live differently and better than African people. We have, we, this is part of what it is that, that we have to say that we're struggling for. We want to see the immediate release of every, every uh, political prisoner, every political prisoner, all these African brothers who are rotting in these prisons because they fought against this nasty colonialism that killed our people with impunity in the streets of this country, just as what we saw happening uh, with, with, uh, with Brother George Floyd. Africans have fought against that and they are rotting in prisons and have been rotting there uh, 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 for, for more than two generations. That is unthinkable. That is uh, something that we cannot allow to continue. We cannot be talking about making a movement that allow these heroes, heroes and heroines. We have to say hands off of Sada Shakur who was able to escape prison and now living in a tenuous situation in Cuba. We have to say in the in the, the quarantine, the economic quarantine of our people uh, in Venezuela, we have to really initiate a, a struggle that recognizes what our interests are uh, as a people. We have to be self-governing. There is no way uh, beyond that. And the African working class has to lead. And the African working class cannot lead without the benefit of its own revolutionary a party, its own vanguard party, its own vanguard party that's guided by advanced revolutionary theory. That's the African People's Socialist Party. We have to join the African People's Socialist Party. We have to support the African People's Socialist Party. And I'm saying that all of you who uh, uh, are participating in this discussion should go to APSP, that is African People's Socialist Party, APSPUhuru.org. We're going to continue this struggle. We're going to continue this study because this discussion because this struggle is going to continue. It's not over now, and we see that the struggle is escalating and it's reaching new heights, new levels of resistance. And it has to result in African people becoming free. It has to result in African people having total, absolute control of Africa and all the resources of Africa, of the liberation of the, all of our people. It has to result in opening up these these prison cells 
where African people are rotting away, not just the political prisoners, but the more than 1 million Africans who these people are stuck in prisons. You never see uh, any of these thugs who, put, who walk around in suits and ties and who occupy positions of power in the government, uh, who wear these uniforms of the government. You don't see them being thrown into prison uh, like this. And nobody can satisfy us by simply locking up uh, or firing four cops uh, in, in Minneapolis. The truth of the matter is what happened in Minneapolis is, is a common. They do it all the time. It is the way the colonizer treats the colonized no matter where uh, the colonized is. Look at Sandra Blank. Look at what they did to her. Look at what they've done to us all over this country. And you know in your own communities where this kind of thing is happening. We have to say one Africa, one nation, all power to the people and black power to the African working class, Uhuru, sisters and brothers and comrades.